So today we're gonna cover a few different items. The first is looking at sort of the build by partner framework, how banks are approaching sort of FinTech generally and uh, looking at certain strategies that have taken place so far. And then we're gonna use uh, our data as well as some insights that we've gathered uh, to look into two specific banks. We'll look at JP Morgan and then we'll look at Goldman Sachs. And we'll, uh, we'll sort of just highlight sort of what the strategy has been so far, where they might be going, uh, and talk a little bit about some of the strategic decisions and moves they've made towards that strategy. So of course this framework's probably nothing new to people in this room. Um, you know, obviously build decisions around uh, innovation tend to be successful when the leadership's in place, thinking about long-term decision making by ensuring that the infrastructure is, is in place for services to be integrated. And obviously we've seen a lot of investments and partnerships over time as, as banks have, have gone deeper into FinTech. Of course, uh, you know, when we look at sort of how uh, folks in corporate innovation tend to, tend to think about these things, uh, we recently did a survey in April uh, where we interviewed about 650 uh, executives in, in corporate innovation. And what we found was that um, companies were actually 2.8x 2 .8 more likely to build uh, than buy when asked uh, what their orientation was, which is so somewhat insular of a view. We were sort of surprised by uh, how many people responded by that. Of course, building requires sort of immense leadership um, and foresight. Uh, it requires uh, really a, from the top thinking about um, a commitment to, to not just sort of technology, but, but making this a core part of the business and strategy. You see here comments from sort of Goldman Sachs CFO, formerly CIO, uh, Marty Chavez, in which they talk about their sort of being overweight to engineering and building software, et cetera. Um, it also requires talent, and we've seen a, a lot more uh, commitment recently or sort of uh, drive from the banks to really uh, find uh, sort of better technology talent. And we've seen some interesting strategies, which we'll talk a little bit about in this presentation, um, that banks are doing now. This specific uh, announcement here that Goldman Sachs is looking to compete more with tech companies even in San Francisco for engineering, uh, engineering positions there. And it also requires a lot of capital commitment. Um, so maybe not necessarily on the degree of what JP Morgan spent in 2016, uh, over 9.5 billion of which 600 million was spent uh, on FinTech. Um, but certainly, you know, the commitment to, to uh, spend the money required uh, to, to really sort of build out the technology. Uh, on the buy side, it's interesting when, that we've seen so far when it comes to banks and FinTech. Um, actually, banks haven't really acquired many FinTech companies to date, uh, and I think that's for a few reasons. One is that um, you know the Silicon Valley best practices in, quickly, in terms of how quickly companies move, in terms of uh, maybe some of the ways that they underwrite or, or sort of analyze data, may not necessarily be you know as uh, banks may not be as comfortable with it. Sometimes on the compliance side, um, just cultural integrations. There's a lot of diff difficulties sometimes. Obviously, companies now who have scaled sometimes have valuations that. Um, obviously that may not meet also sort of banks' appetite given sort of, uh, you know, thinking about return on equity and, and these companies typically in fintech are, are non-accretive. So, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons for why banks haven't been invested in, in fintech, haven't acquired many companies in fintech yet to date, although that's changing a, a little bit. We're starting to see uh, banks uh, start to acquire fintech companies in, in different areas, uh, notably, uh, BBVA, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, um, and, and a number of others are making small acquisitions here and there, and, and this is data that we continue to monitor over time, whether this will increase or not. But we've seen a small increase over the last, uh, it's a year or so. Um, and what we found is that banks are thinking about acquisitions differently. Uh, now that we've seen thousands of fintech companies emerge over the last uh, five years, um, not all of them obviously uh, will su be successful, and banks in some cases are thinking about these actually from a talent perspective. How can we actually bring on the teams uh, of these companies who have experience building out, say, a digital credit card product or um, a digital lending product, uh, all the product managers and engineering uh, talent that comes with it, and, and bringing those teams and integrating it in uh, to the banks uh, or their units. Uh, and of course, we've also seen a lot of investments and partnerships so far. So this is data that we track pretty frequently, uh, looking at how banks have invested in fintech companies. Uh, here is a chart we put together of sort of the most active uh, banks uh, investing in fintech companies across sort of the different lines of business. You see some of the active players here. Uh, and of course, it's not just US banks, but also sort of global banks uh, as well. 
Uh, this year, look at, at some of the European banks that are active in, actively investing in fintech names like Santander, uh, UBS, Barclays, and others. And again, across a number of areas, both on the consumer side and um, on the infrastructure or capital market side uh, and different companies. Uh, what's notable is actually, I think a lot of the companies that banks invest in uh, actually tend to be the same companies. You see a lot of syndication of deals. We had uh, Symphony, for example, here last uh, yesterday, and a lot of banks obviously involved in, in that sort of strategic effort. Um, and on the partnership side, I mean, it's, it's hard for us here to go through all the different partnerships that banks are, are striking. I think you know, JP Morgan is a good segue into the next segment uh, of how they've used digital, digital partnerships to uh, really scale some of the product offerings, make them more efficient. So they have a partnership, for example, with OnDeck Capital, which powers their small business lending product, Chase Business Quick Capital. They extended that partnership last year for another four years. Um, and really sort of cutting down the time, uh, the application process there. And, and so you're seeing banks look to, to work with certain fintech companies to, to really um, to provide sort of efficiencies in, in, different, in different areas and in, in products that they offer. Uh, of course, so why are we talking about JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs today? I think you know, what's interesting is both of them obviously want to be technology companies. They both publicly said that. Um, you know, we heard from Marcus yesterday and the efforts that they're, they're making. Um, so why don't we just go through some of the playbooks we've, we've observed so far. So when we talk about playbooks, we're talking mostly about the consumer uh, journey here. And uh, so we'll start with JP Morgan. Um, so our view is they're doing a few very interesting things. Uh, one is thinking a lot more about sort of digital account creation. Uh, the second is really gaining access to the payments network and, and doing a lot of work on the payment side uh, in terms of innovation and through both acquiring companies, investing companies, and also just building out their Chase Pay product. Uh, and also thinking about other digital financial services that, that they can uh, add on as well. We'll talk a little about the wealth management efforts. Um, so obviously, you know, digital account creation, just trying to figure out you know, ways to make this easier for consumers. Um, they've also launched other new apps. Uh, one is called Fin, which is a, a millennial-focused app which you know, uses sort of emojis and pizza icons to try to get people to, uh, not, uh, to open a checking account and monitor it. I think what's interesting today is so far, um, its traction's been a little low, it's still early, um, but, at, but if you look at Chase Mobile, for example, uh, it's certainly a you know, much smaller app there so far in terms of traction. Um, but another effort to, to, to really sort of enable digital account creation. And obviously, JP Morgan has, has been um, actively partnering on, on the card front, uh, two of the notable cards, the Amazon Prime card, which they offer so big discounts now on Whole Foods as well. And the Chase Sapphire Reserve and, and Chase Sapphire cards, which actually have pretty strong brand equity uh, and have done quite well in terms of attrition. Uh, and today, you know, Chase obviously has the, the largest sort of credit card balance market share um, of all the card companies today. Um, so payments is, is really the area where we see JP Morgan focused on the fintech side when we, when we look at all the things they're doing. Um, Chase Pay sort of enabling sort of omni-channel payments, um, offline offering sort of cash back you know, possibilities at, at places like Best Buy and, and Shell gas stations. Online, you know, being able to use Chase Pay and, and integrate it into different services to, to make it more so you don't have to necessarily think about it, um, knowing that, that you know, there'll be an option there. So you're seeing a lot of efforts there. And also on the peer-to-peer -peer front, uh, Zelle, uh, of course, you know, integrates directly with the app. People not necessarily downloading and looking for Zelle to, to use, but you know, the fact that it's in, uh, sort of enabled by all the sort of bank websites and apps um, sort of spurring the growth. Uh, eMarketer put some data out recently that, that they believe you know, Zelle will grow much quicker than Venmo or Square Cash, although obviously the use case and, and the way they're doing that is, is quite different. Um, so we're also seeing Chase Pay expand through a bunch of different channels, whether that's through partnerships, you know, investments, um, buying companies, or sort of building companies. Um, so par in partnerships, we're seeing them sort of build out a lot more partnerships uh, with companies uh, on the commerce front. Uh, Big Commerce and Touch Bistro are, are two of their notable partners. Um, we've also seen them make s several strategic investments. So uh, Level Up and, and Bill.com, uh, who they both actively partner with, um, also you know, made pretty big investments to, to align themselves with those companies as well. Um, as well as buying companies, uh, JP Morgan made one of the biggest fintech acquisitions that a bank's uh, done you know, in recent memory with WePay, which they acquired for about $400 million. And then building, we just talked a little bit about how they're, do, they're using Zelle and Finn. Um, so what does this look like? You know, it, it's trying to build all this and, and integrate it really into the experience. So you know, being able to use sort of QR code scan at the POS or integrating Level Up directly into their app, which is a food delivery service, um, things like that. Um, so in terms of what's next, I think where we start, where we're seeing JP Morgan thinking about focusing is other types of products um, that they, they might want to offer. So Chase Mobile is a pretty strategic asset 
in this regard, a strategic mobile asset uh, with about 28 million users. Um, and perhaps they could use this to, to really think about other ways, um, other financial services to, to integrate onto the app. Um, as, as you mentioned, I think there's a lot of different considerations being made every year. If, if this is the long-term thing towards sort of digital uh, finance, you know, for example, uh, on the robo side, J.P. Morgan was said to be thinking about acquiring uh, Sigfig, which is a robo advisor that actually just recently raised some more money this week, um, but instead decided to build out uh, their own uh, robo advisor, you know, uh, in, as of last year, uh, and doing this with a partnership with a company they invested in called InvestCloud. Um, you know, a benefit here is just being able to sort of use this partnership to um, wrangle a lot of data on, on the back end to, to make it easier and more seamless. Um, and we're also seeing JP Morgan think about digital wealth solutions in, in four key categories, whether that's robo-advising, whether it's online and mobile investing, uh, whether it's providing uh, education, financial education, and ways to do that digitally as well, uh, as well as sort of more portfolio insights. Of course, we'll see, um, you know, JP Morgan will be taking on sort of robo-advisor startups that have featured lower fees uh, to date. Um, and it'll be interesting to see uh, the approach of, of how they sort of look to acquire customers versus, you know, companies like a wealth front who's thinking very much about sort of uh, a specific path uh, for, for consumers. Um, and, you know, you, you never say never, but you, we, there's also possibilities that JP Morgan might think about other things. Uh, this is a quote that got a lot of notoriety, um, that potentially they'll think about robo and, and even maybe brokerage and giving it actually for free, although that remains to be seen whether this will actually be something they actually do. Um, and then one other theme that we like to think about is actually on the talent side. So um, talent feeling in, uh, uh, innovation is, is a big thing uh, at, at banks that are trying to take this approach. Uh, obviously, a number of different job post, uh, open job positions, uh, not just on the technology side, but on actually specific digital roles. And these roles look very different in, uh, at banks today um, than they did 10 years ago, whether that's you know, marketing managers for gamification or machine learning engineers or API product managers, mobile app pro uh, product managers. And, and we expect that to continue to, to start to develop and, and, and look different, which is, which is exciting. Uh, and I think the other thing is we talked a little bit about M&A. Um, talent is also a big part of this. We'll talk about Goldman in a second. But um, WePay, for example, which was uh, acquired by J.P. Morgan in October, has since increased their engineers by about 33% since then. So building out actually becoming almost like a hub for them in Silicon Valley uh, to, to bring on more engineers, which is, which is interesting as well. Um, so next, we'll just end by talking about a little bit about Goldman Sachs and, and what we're seeing from them. Um, so our view of, of Goldman's playbook, at least where we see this going, is really um, thinking about sort of the, the consumer start point. So Clarity Money was an app they just acquired, a personal finance management app. Obviously, to date, they, they, they offer sort of personal loans through the Marcus website. Uh, and, and eventually, we see them sort of developing other types of services over time. We heard Harit mention, uh, allude to as much, whether that might be auto uh, loan products or mortgage products or, or others. Um, so, you know, as we talked about some of those different considerations that are being made, um, rather than build uh, an iPhone app themselves, which they were rumored to be doing, Goldman actually did buy Clarity Money. Uh, Clarity is a personal finance management app that was acquired for about a million users that they had at the time, um, and uh, which was, you know, interesting in comparison to maybe some of the other personal finance management apps that have been acquired over time, like Mint and Check uh, and others. Um, and what it is, is it's really just sort of a financial wellness uh, app in one place. There's a lot of personal finance management apps today, um, but Goldman thinking about this as, as maybe sort of the beachhead for where they can distribute a lot of the, the eventual Marcus products that they plan to offer over time. So what are those products? Well, to start, you know, Marcus has really focused obviously on, on personal loans and savings through GS Bank, uh, you know, no fee personal loans. You see sort of their website here. Um, and they were able to scale much quicker uh, to you know, certain uh, loan amounts than, than other alternative lenders who, who came maybe 10 years earlier. Uh, part of the reason they were able to do this was you know, focusing on sort of middleware APIs and being able to uh, use the same digital marketing and, and digital acquisition tools that the other lenders are on. So if today, if you go on Credit Karma, you'll see a, a Marcus loan next to a, a Lending Club loan or, or SoFi loan. So, um, you know, we, we've seen them scale so far to about uh, 2.3 billion in, in loans originated to date and deposits about uh, 17 billion. So obviously, um, you know, Marcus still small in the grand scheme of the Goldman Sachs balance sheet, but, you know, the growth uh, to date over a year has, has, has grown um, 
pretty steadily. And we've also seen markets try to compete with other alternative lenders in terms of um, terms, right? So whether that's on fees, origination fees, or late fees, or whether that's on, on term length, uh, and this is somewhere where as maybe perhaps the personal online loans are becoming more commoditized, those types of uh, term features are actually pretty, um, actually uh, weigh heavily on, on the consumer as well. And also market savings rates are about, um, are actually you know, higher than the national average as well. Um, of course, the, the, the next iteration of where this might go, credit is certainly uh, the next step. And um, Go Marcus is teaming up with Apple to launch sort of a, a, a Goldman and Apple Pay branded credit card. Um, there's speculation that this could go in other directions as well. Um, and as of now, Apple actually works with Barclays. Um, so credit seems to be, is definitely the next area where we'll see uh, Goldman uh, make a move. They acquired a team called Final, which was a, a credit card startup earlier as well. Um, you know, they've also made a lot of investments in fintech companies in a number of different areas. It's, you know, it's said that Marcus was developed with the help of, sort of their private equity team uh, who helped weigh in decisions on, on where they might, uh, how they were thinking about building this. Um, but it's also interesting to think about potential possibilities of some of their investments and, and Marcus. Uh, Marketa is a company that they back, which um, could open the door for them to offer uh, different types of point of sale lending. This is actually an API to create uh, sort of customized cards. Um, so lots of potential uh, things th that could happen as well. Um, and where are they going next? Well, certainly there's a number of different products uh, that they've talked about. Um, you know, it, it may not be that Marcus develops these products or adds them to the platform before you know they become more um, before the, the buying process becomes more uh, digitally oriented. So I, I'd imagine they wouldn't move into mortgage before. Um, before more mortgages are actually bought online. Although, you know, we, we, we expect them to move sort of towards a, a broader product suite over time and, and, and build this into sort of a cycle through Clarity. Um, they have made a few investments in, in different areas as well. So mortgage, they've invested in a number of different companies, whether it's digital mortgage lenders or sort of mortgage broker, uh, Trestle in the UK. And they've also invested uh, in, a in a number of companies in small business, which will be interesting to see if they decide to go in that direction as well. Two of the companies they've invested in in the small business lending space are NAV, which is a, a sort of credit karma model for small businesses, and, and Neighbor, which is sort of a B2B2C a small business lending company in the UK. Um, and B2B is a potentially interesting you know, channel and, and it, that we might see Marcus go down. Um, Goldman owns a company called ACO, which is, uh, sort of builds websites for companies to, to help in, uh, rank and file employees understand, sort of manage their finances. And this could potentially be you know, tied into a, a Marcus for Work type offering with 401ks or other types of products um, that we might see in the future. And similar to the JP Morgan, um, uh, JP Morgan section, you know, I think this focus on talent is again important. Uh, about a little less than half of all Goldman jobs, uh, open job positions are in, on the technology uh, side. And we've also seen um, M&A function uh, as, as sort of a uh, for talent as well uh, in a different way that, that maybe JP Morgan, uh, we pay acquisition has functioned, where they're actually just looking for specific teams that, that could help them build out maybe certain products. And we've seen them allude to as much as, as bringing on uh, these, these employees. Um, of course, there's a lot of reasons right, to be skeptical that this, these, will, these efforts will eventually pay off, although um, you know, it's hard to say that given all the, the move towards digitization. Um, but you know, I, I think there's, there are still you know, contrasting things that are happening. For example, JP Morgan has actually added about 2,000 more branches uh, over the last 10 years than they had in 2006, plans to open another 400 branches in, in the next few years. Um, so certainly, given all the efforts and, and, and um, uh, sort of uh, resources devoted towards digitization, still obviously uh, other functions as well that they're continuing to operate. Also, you know, operating as a consumer-facing brand is, is not an easy task. We, the, when we hear from VCs and, and a lot of alternative lenders who compete with, uh, with Marcus and others, they, they talk a lot about sort of the consumer brand and, and, and Goldman maybe won't be able to, to fully be able to do that given obviously the, all the other activities they're involved in. Um, and potentially we'll see other competitors uh, over time. Uh, this was an article that hinted potentially at another bank maybe offering a, a Marcus type product. Um, and whether that happens or not, you know, the ability to offer better terms, uh, digital loans that could be uh, with the big balance sheet could be, could be interesting as well as, as we think about the future. Obviously where we are in, in the credit cycle is also another consideration right now for maybe how these, these products um, evolve over time. Um, looking ahead just to end and wrap up the presentation, um, 
So as banks are doing this, we've also seen a number of startups uh, look to not just sort of provide sort of a single product experience and sort of not necessarily unbundle, but focus heavily on, on, on providing a, a great sort of uh, experience on a single product, but now starting to actually thinking about uh, their next act and, and what are the products uh, they, they might be able to offer. So companies now that are in the millions of users, of startups that are in the millions of users, now thinking about adding checking, checking accounts and, and um, banking-like products over time. Uh, and we'll see if, if consumers, if these really resonate with consumers, um, another trend that's sort of happening on the other side of, of what we're seeing banks doing. Um, and who does JP Morgan always talk about? You know, there was an institutional investor article that came out uh, in May and uh, you know, mentioned Amazon actually 59 times in an interview with Jamie Dimon. So I think, I think it's interesting to see you know, where this goes, both in terms of what you know, bigger platform companies do. Obviously, there's a possibility of Amazon offering a checking account product with JP Morgan or others. And, and I think you know, with, all, with all that's happening, both on the fintech side as well as how banks are thinking about this, uh, certainly a lot to monitor. But um, hopefully, this provides just a little bit of a look into strategy and, and how we're seeing some of the evolution of uh, some of the moves we read about uh, every day. Uh, so thank you for joining us. We'll be sending all the slides, both from this presentation as well as um, all the other presentations we did, uh, both on the main stage as well as in, in the briefing room. And I uh, just want to thank everyone again for coming to the conference. Thanks.